Welcome to episode 442 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger with SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing producer David Zuckerman. He is a producer, so we talk about his career and how he has found screen, screenplays to produce, but he's also the founder and owner of VPF, the Virtual Pitch Fest, and he's graciously agreed to be a sponsor of our of the SYS Six Figure Screenplay Contest and give away some free pitches to the winners and runners up of the contest. So check out the contest page for those details, sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. And in fact, at the end of the interview, he tells listeners how they can get a free pitch through his service just by emailing him. He's going to give away a few. So um, so that's nice. Some real tangible items for screenwriters looking to, um, to help market their material. So stay tuned for that interview. SYS's Six Figure Screenplay Contest is still open for submissions, but this is the final week. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. Our final deadline is July 31st. We're looking for low budget shorts and features. I'm defining low budget as less than six figures. In other words, less than one million US dollars. We've got lots of industry judges reading the scripts in the later rounds. We're giving away thousands in cash and prizes. If you want to submit to the contest or learn more about it, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. Contest. Also this year, we are running an in-person film festival in tandem with our screenplay contest. It's for low-budget films pr produced for less than one million U.S. dollars. We have a features and a shorts category, just like the screenplay contest, and we have lots of industry judges who are going to be looking at these films and helping with that. So again, just like our screenplay contest, the festival is going to t take place in Hollywood, California, from October 7th to the 9th. If you have a finished film or know someone who does, please send them our way. www sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival. You'll see a link to Film Freeway. We're actually taking all the submissions for the film for the film festival through Film Freeway. So you can find us on Film Freeway as well. Once again, if this sounds like something that you'd like to learn more about or perhaps even enter, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest for the contest and sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival for the festival. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episode number 442. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing producer and founder of Virtual Pitch Fest, David Zuckerman. Here is the interview. Welcome, David, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. I'm really happy to be here. I love doing podcasts. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Well, I grew up on the mean streets of Pacific Palisades. It's a <laughs> You know, rough time there, you know, uh -huh. it was like uh, surfers versus surfers and all that. <laughs> so I got interested from a very, very young age in the movie business, primarily because of two reasons. My grandfather, who was a pretty famous author turned screenwriter, and um, my mom, uh, who my grandfather wrote a book about that then became many movies and television series. And I really looked up to my grandfather, of course, I looked up to my mom as well. The, um, what the franchise was Gidget. So she was one of the first female surfers hmm. uh, to hit the waves in Malibu. And he wrote a book about her life. You know, it was a novel, but it was based on what was going on down there at the time. And it was really seminal. It was 1957 and it became an instant bestseller. It was beating out on the road. And um, huh. I really looked up to, you know, all that. And, admired my grandfather. He was like an old school, you know, German guy. Um, but, uh, you know, he was cool and uh, yeah. very intelligent. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So you're growing up in Pacific Palisades. Then what were some of these first steps to turn this into an actual career? Did you think you were going to ultimately be a writer? How did you find your niche in producing? I did some 
time off of college. So I was a couple years into UCLA and I was getting a little bored and I worked on a couple movies to give me myself a sense of what it would be like. So I was lucky enough to, to work on a movie called Bestseller that was with Brian Dennehy and James Woods. And I also worked on a movie called Assassination that my cousin Poncho produced. And that was with Charles Bronson towards the end of his career. So I had a sense of uh, what it was like to be on set um, but even with that, I really started out wanting to be a screenwriter and uh, I had some minimal success, you know, some options and so on. But when I was reading my friend's scripts or scripts that I thought were really good, I, I didn't think I was as good as they were. So I decided to get into producing, frankly. And I found that to be something that just sort of like organically really worked out for me. I found it a lot easier to tell other people what to do than to actually do it myself. <laughs> but, you know, writing is tough. Um, mm -hmm. Ironically, like I've gone back into now writing and I want to get into writing and directing again after having produced a bunch of movies. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of your first credits. I noticed on IMDb, Catalina Trust is your first producer credit as a feature. Um, just how did you get that produced? What was sort of the magic sauce there in getting that film made? It was interesting. I think I had put out an ad um, for a, a grip for a short film I was doing. And a guy called me named Harry Hope ends up being uh, one of the nephews of Bob Hope, you know, the comedian. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a real cool guy. I, I didn't, I couldn't get him a job because I had already hired someone. And then he was like an angel. A couple of months later, he, for some reason, gave me a call and he said, Hey, based on our conversation, I think you'd be a good fit for this, uh, uh, movie that I hear is uh, in need of a producer. And he set me up with this guy named Todd Hagopian, uh, who uh, had put the money together for this film called Catalina Trust. And he asked me if I wanted to produce. And I mm -hmm. said yes. And uh, so I was a hired hand on that. And then um, the same investment group wanted to do another movie within two weeks of wrapping Catalina Trust. And that movie was Chump Change. So I went ahead and produced that. And that was a movie that was picked up by Miramax. And we had some nice faces in it, like Tim Matheson and Jerry Stiller. And, hmm. uh, it, you know, Tracy Lore is actually in the romantic lead. And she was quite good and quite fun to work with. Mm -hmm. And so that did quite well. We shot that, that in Milwaukee. Uh huh. And it's, it's fascinating to hear you say that I'm a big proponent telling writers get out there, you know, produce a short and stuff. And it sounds like, you know, just doing some of these shorts and just doing stuff. You meet so many people just getting out there and doing stuff as opposed to sitting in your room and just typing away at script pages. Yes. And, you know, I did put money, you know, decent money into the shorts and uh, my own money into one of them. And mm -hmm. it looked really well, really good. Um, uh, you know, from a production standpoint. Uh, so people were looking at that and like, gosh, how did you only do that for, you know, $8,000? And um, so then I got hired from these folks on Young and the Restless that were wanting to do a short. And it was like a $50,000 budget or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, longer film. And it ended up, uh, you know, with winning a huge film festival that was one of those that if you won, you could, would be considered uh, for you know, the Nicole, I'm sorry, Oscar. And so um, that, I guess, uh, gave me some notice as well. And mm -hmm. so those two films, yes, I mean, I, I think it's, it's correct um, that getting yourself out there and doing it, but doing it well also. Uh, and I knew enough, you know, because my family was surrounded in the business that you don't, not, you don't always get second chances. So whatever you put out there, it has to be good in at least one respect. You know, like the writing has to be really good. The directing has to be really good or the production has to be really good. And if one of those are good, then you have a shot of moving up and meeting people and going yeah. to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. So more recently, you produced a movie, The Fourth Noble Truth. And actually, we're going to screen this at the film festival in October. Um, talk about that one a little bit. How did that one come about? How did you ultimately get that produced? And this is a much later stage of your producing career now. So, um, you know, let's let maybe we can hear that story. Sure. Um, I, I was still looking, and this was maybe about eight years ago now, that I was still looking for a film. I had done a film called Strictly Sexual for a very low budget that became the number one watch film on Hulu for like eight years. So it did really, really well for my investors. 
So I was looking for another project that would be similar that they might want to invest in. And my buddy, Gary McDonald, who's a Writers Guild member and who was a good friend of mine, and he was really into meditation and uh, he had written a script about meditation. Hmm. So, you know, one of those really difficult ones to think of, you know, how do you do a script about meditation? But the story was interesting. It was about a, um, a movie star who's in trouble with the law. He's kind of a bad boy. And his lawyer suggests that he do private meditation instruction because he knows the judge loves his meditation teacher. Hmm. So when I'm looking for a movie that I can shoot for, you know, under 500,000, let's say, uh, under 250,000, under 100,000, um, I'm looking for uh, a good story that has minimal cast members uh, and also has minimal locations. And mm -hmm. both Strictly Sexual and The Fourth Noble Truth fit that bill. And it was also a very nice challenge to, to try to uh, bring the idea of meditation and what that means, you know, to, the, to, ex to be more accessible for folks. Mm -hmm. And Harry Hamlin um, ended up starring in it. Kristen Kerr was the, was the female lead, and she was in my movie Strictly Sexual. I, you know, she's got world-class chops. She, you know, has... Uh, you know, class A, you know, could have been a huge star. I think she, you know, decided to become a mom and take care of her kids and all that, but she was, um, she's quite compelling. So that's how that came about. I liked the script. I talked to Gary and, and we said, yeah, yeah, let's, let's do this. And so you're going along with your career, you're producing these films. Um, at what point did Virtual Pitch Fest come up? And maybe we can sort of start to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, what is Virtual Pitch Fest and when did you establish it? Well, Virtual Pitch Fest, and we like to use the acronym VPF these days, was started, gosh, about 15 years ago. And I was just starting to do some script consulting at the time. I was also working as head of development for a company called Silver Lion Films, where I had production supervised Crocodile Dundee in LA, and I had worked a lot on Man on Fire uh, with Denzel Washington. But in the meantime, time I was thinking about um, what do I want to do when I move out of development and strike out on my own more again. Uh, so I started a company called Script Coach that does script coverage and uh, we still offer that but we don't really advertise it much anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was working with clients who I would help perfect scripts with and then they would ask me what do I do now you know and I didn't really have a great answer for them you know what do you do now if you're an unknown writer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking about um, this while being invited to these script uh, events. You know, they would have these writer events like the LA Screenwriting Expo, and they would have pitch events as part of those conferences. So at its height, the LA Screenwriting Expo had like 4,500 folks, you know, writers coming from all over the place. And they'd wow. have to spend a lot of money for lodging, airfare, et cetera. Uh, part of that conference was, um, you know, I would be invited with other industry pros to hear five minute pitches uh, that they would pay 25 bucks a pop for. And I started to think about how would I be able to make this more friendly, you know, for mm -hmm. the writer. The pros uh, really have more of an interest, I realized, in reading something rather than hearing you pitch. You know, of course, if you're a great pitcher, you know, it helps. But at the end of the day, they're just going to ask you to, to see a query letter or something like that. And I just thought about, hey, you know, let's let's try to find a way to move this experience online. And there was a gal friend of mine, Katie Coyle, who really helped me with this uh, at the time as well. She's a co-founder. She's no longer working with us. Um, she went off and had a kid and, and, and all that about 10 years ago. Um, but I'm, I am indebted to her like a lot. Um, and anyway, so we just started gathering pros, we pitched the idea, we built the website, and we wanted to try to make it a realistic situation. We didn't want to blow smoke up any writers, you know what. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that we went about that was through the query letter, because it used to be you'd get you'd send query letters through the mail, you know, through the snail mail. And, you know, a development person would probably just throw it in the trash because they, or they might look at it, you know, and you'd send a self-addressed a self stamped envelope. We just moved that into uh, the realm of the online world. And 
um, it was a lot cheaper. Instead of you know twenty five dollars a pitch, it's you know less than ten dollars a pitch. You get the guaranteed response back. So every time that you send a pitch to someone and you can pick and choose who you want to send to, um, you'll definitely get a, an email response back saying, hey, please send me the script or no, thank you. Mm -hmm. So it was that access and that guaranteed response is particularly the access that like really inspired me. Um, you know, it's like, again, going back to my grandfather who had to immigrate from Germany, you know, in the thirties and start, and start out uh, again, sort of like without much. Uh, and, you know, America gave him that access, gave him the ability to um, improve himself and to start a, his career uh, over here. And um, that's been my inspiration for sort of having a, a, a more democratic approach, you know, for writers. We don't really get much into, you know, evaluating the scripts and so on. We do have a hot list contest of the most uh, requested scripts of the month where winners will get free pitches, but mostly we're just about getting the access so and that's really important you know for writers to have so th they, they know that they're now interacting and actually connecting with an industry professional so it really came out of that uh, live pitch experience and then out, uh, you know a few years after we started the website we, we unfortunately had the big you know real estate crash and that um, combined with the success of virtual pitch fest sort of ended uh, the whole live event ex uh, experience and you rarely see these anymore especially again after covid yeah. so um yeah and I'm, I'm really blessed i mean i uh, to have the website i have some great people that work for me we have like 500 industry pros that participate and we've had a lot of success stories that i'm really proud of mm -hmm. you know it's and I'm curious, um, one of the things that I've recommended over the years, and I use this myself as a screenwriter, is, you know, people always want, you have a good number of like really high-end companies in your database. Um, and so you you can get, get, get access to them. Whereas if you just send them a cold query letter yourself, um, they're probably not going to even read it. Um, but maybe there's some other tips. Are there some other ins and outs of this that um, you can kind of tell our, our audience about? And I'll just, on the flip side, as I said, it seemed like there's a lot of good access to companies, but are there some companies that maybe you would say, you know, certain writers go this direction, or is there a way for, you know, a TV writer can use it a little differently than a, than a feature writer? Just maybe there's some tips on how to use the system. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say like the reason that the pros use our website is, you know, the fact that they can post their credits and they can post what it is that they're looking for. And they are protected. So the writer, when the writer signs the agree to terms and conditions page, it covers the pro and the writer. So the pros have felt protected. This has been vetted like by DreamWorks and so forth, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one reason why they prefer to use Virtual Pitch Fest as the accepted platform for receiving material. Um, another reason um, that they like to use Virtual Pitch Fest is um, that it's a, a very convenient and easy for them. So they log on to a, their account when they've received the pitch, they can read the three paragraph pitch and then they can click yes or no. And they also will have a record of it. Uh, so both the writer and the pro have a built in tracking system on Virtual Pitch Fest. So you can track where you pitch a script to, uh, who said yes, who said no, et cetera. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, do you have any tips on pitching? Are there particular genres that do better through your system? Are there particular types of scripts that might do better? Um, you know, you got any tips and just in terms of that? Yeah. And I, I first wanted to address, you know, the strategy uh, idea, you know, that um, you asked me about before in terms of like, well, I know we have, there's a lot of big companies. Yes. And we do have a lot of television uh, companies on there as well. And companies that are looking for both TV and film and that's searchable uh, once you register. No matter what I tend to uh, advise people, it always seems that people love to pitch to the big players, you know, mm -hmm. but that's not always, that wouldn't be necessarily my recommendation. Um, I think that it's um, a good idea to spread it out a bit. And sometimes the small independent producers is your best ally, especially if you're a new writer. Now, it's not just new writers that use the website. We've had we have Writers Guild members on there, we have experienced members, but particularly for the new writer who may not have a lot of connections, it's almost a little bit better to produce like the, the small, I'm sorry, to pitch the smaller or more um, 
medium-sized companies and or also pitch agents and managers. We also have agents and managers who are looking to represent writers. In terms of the question uh, regarding um, the script genres and so forth and what's popular, I think it's just always the same. You're gonna hear the same story all the time, but it never, there's always these exceptions. So it's like, you're always gonna hear that Comedy is more difficult because it doesn't translate internationally, but action does. And don't write a movie about the movie business or, you know, all yeah, of these, yeah. you don't do a period piece. But the, I mean, yeah. there's so many exceptions to it that at the end of the day, every pro in Hollywood is going to be looking for a good script. If And if they're not, if, they, if their company doesn't want it, like because they, they have something similar, they will send it to another pro. Uh, you know, because, you know, that they want to get some credit, maybe that, that that company would give them some type of fee for showing them that script. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's about good stories. And and I know that's a, it's a cliche. Um, it, from my experience in development and producing, you know, I, Silver Lion Films, I mentioned, so I was there for a few years. And, you know, we would solicit scripts, you know, from everyone we would get submissions from CAA, ICM, William Morris. We would also get submissions from the neighbor or the friend, you know, who happened to have a script for us to cover. And what I realized is no matter where the scripts are coming from, about one in every 50, I ended up optioning. Didn't matter, you know, if I got 50 scripts from CAA or 50 scripts huh. from, uh, you know, the neighborhood. Um, it just didn't seem to matter whatsoever. And that's just because a good script is really hard to find. So out of the, you know, so one in 50, I'd be interested in one in 25, but I'd end up optioning one in 50 because I like to track this, you know, and see what the statistics would be. And I've talked to many pros because I, you know, am able to converse with them because they're members of Virtual Pitch Fest and I found that it's the same thing, mm -hmm. you know? So, it, it, you know, they'll, so, you know, just because you're, you're wrapped at a big agency doesn't mean you're going to have a good script. You know, um, uh, so I just recommend really working hard on your craft and also making sure that you're sending out really good stuff. And the only way to make sure of that, in my way of thinking, is to have seven out of 10 readers who know what they're talking about really like your script. And that's you got to find about 10 readers. And some of those readers can be script consultants, you know, script consultants that you trust. Uh, some can be in actors that you trust who are in the business, writers, directors. But once you get to that seven out of 10, I think it's ready to pitch. It's not all that different from, you know, selling toothpaste, you know, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, the way that I, I found it, uh, the way that works for me. I don't like to send scripts out. I don't like to make films where, where I don't have that uh, statistic in place first. So I know I have a pretty good shot you know, at people liking the movie. Do you have any tips on far as the actual query letter? Um, do you recommend, you know, tips on writing the log line? Do you put a little background information about yourself? What is involved in this query letter that's going that's through, your, through system? your system? Sure. Um, I, first, I, I want to make sure that if I'm sending a query to somebody that first, you know, I've done my research and they are looking for this type of material and you can find that out on the website itself. And then I like to introduce myself right off the bat. And in terms of prior successes, I think if you've sold or optioned something, you've published a best-selling book, not a self-published one, but some, you know, one that was actually, you know, best-selling, or you've won a medium to um, large script contest, I think that's really important. Um, even if you were a semi-finalist in a medium-sized or large one, it's mm -hmm. worth mentioning. Because that gets my attention as a producer, and I know it gets others' uh, attention. So I would I would put that in the very first, you know, like three sentence opener. Hi, my name is, you know, David Z, and you know, um, I'm, I'd like to pitch to you this rom com called David and Ashley Hit the Streets uh -huh. uh, and have a lot of fun together uh, watching movies. And um, it's, it's not you know, overly compelling. <laughs> <laughs> well. You know, we have to talk about the blonde bombshells that are here. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, then I will say, oh, I've uh, in my history, I've you know, I've I actually have I recently optioned something to X Y Z company, and I actually won the uh, a, a Sundance Film Festival uh, semifinalist uh, award 
uh, from my script, um, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's going to get the attention of folks. And it doesn't have to be Sundance, really. I mean, if you win any screen uh, competition, and like I know you guys run one, um, and, you know, anything that gets over like 100 entries mm-hmm. and you win it, that's something to be proud of. And, and I, w- I would mention, as long as you're not like this thing like 10 of them, you know, just try mm-hmm. to, you know, if you, if you have 10, just try to pick the top two or three. Yeah. And then in the second paragraph, the first thing I like to do is compare the film to recent um, box office successes. Now, you have to do research here to make sure they're box office successes. Um, Sometimes if it's a critical success and not a box office success, that's also okay. But you're, you're better off, you know, when pitching a TV series or a movie to try to find a couple comparisons uh, of films that actually made money. And so that, you know, you want to try to look around, you know, box office, office mojo or IMDb pro, um, just do a little research, you know, before you start comparing your, your series and yeah. your, your film. <laughs> and then you just, and then the, the, the important part here is now you've got to pitch your, your script. So a couple one rule is don't give away the ending at the end, okay? You want to make, keep your object in mind. And this is where some writers, you know, when you're in the middle of it, you kind of forget, well, what's the object here? The object is for a producer or an agent, whoever you pitch to, to request the script. That's it. It's not to make the movie, you know? Mm-hmm. It's not to grade the query. It's to say, yes, please send me the script. And anybody really with any story is capable of writing a good query letter where someone will say, yes, please send me the script. And so in order to make a query letter compelling, you don't give away the ending. And in my point of view, you want to lead from the character's perspective. You don't want your pitch to be plot driven because if it's plot driven, people tend to just get confused. But if you lead with a compelling character, then the, the reader sucked in from the get-go. So I always um, recommend, you know, like start with that lead and follow the story through that lead's perspective. Now that means you're not going to be able to explain everything about your movie, but you're going to be able to tell the most important parts of it because the most important parts of the film generally are about the hero. Now, someone might say, well, I have an ensemble script. And I would say to you, I have no idea how to pitch an ensemble script. It's not my forte. <laughs> mm-hmm. But because I, I, as a reader, I have a really hard time reading ensemble scripts, but like some of them are great. Like look at the big chill, for example. So sometimes I, I'm like, I don't know if I have said yes to this particular script. So I haven't quite wrapped my head around how you necessarily pitch an ensemble. Um, but even in some of the ensembles, for example, the big chill, you can you can kind of figure out who the lead is by in within the ensemble by who changes the most who has the most complete arc and who learns the most from it you know so in the big chill it's probably the ex uh disc jockey you know um uh that is the guy who's maybe the, the lead so you would probably try to pitch it from that person's perspective so the character is really the most important thing um i've gotten confirmation from this you know from other uh, professionals when i've been on panels and and had a chance to meet them um, another rule of mine when it comes to scripts in general and something that you want to try to uh, explain in the query is that your hero has to have a very concrete, practical goal. And that has to be explained. Again, you don't want to give away the ending, whether or not he or she achieves it. And that practical goal should be tied to the character's learning experience. In other words, whatever the character learns at the end, he lear- he achieved his practical goal because of that. So we would call that an emotional goal. You know, so uh, Wizard of Oz is a great example. When the movie starts, you know, Dorothy uh, says, um, I want to be someplace over the rainbow. You know, that is saying that she's not happy where she is. She has not accepted, you know, her life, you know. Um, and by the end of the movie, she has, through her journey, you know, she has realized that there's no place like home. There's no place like home. So by, um, and then she, now she's happy, you know, and she had to go through a bunch of steps to make that realization. So when she realizes that she wants to go home, 
that's when she um, come, you know, is freed from Oz, you know, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, so that, that's like a really good example I like to use because most people have seen Wizard of Oz. I don't know about the younger people these days. Sometimes I'm like, have you seen, like they haven't seen Top Gun yet. You know, I'm like, have you yeah. seen Maverick? They're like, I haven't seen Top Gun. I'm like, well, you should see Top Gun. And then, you know, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I try to use that example. Um, yeah, Wizard of Oz is classic. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully classic. people have seen that. So yeah. do, you, do you recommend putting, because one question I get a lot from people is, well, if I don't have any credits, you know, what do I do? And I genuinely, generally tell them, you know, if you're a lawyer and you're writing a law and order episode, you know, that's pertinent information. So if there's some way of telling the producer why you're the perfect writer for this particular script, I usually recommend it. But what do you, what do you say on that topic? I think... It really depends if it's a, if it's specific to a legal case, you know, or it's a law story. Yes, I think because in our society, we tend to value the doctor, or the lawyer, the psychologist, perhaps. But also, we love the word new in our society. So you can spin it by saying, I'm a brand new writer, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, I've, I've been really working on my craft and I'm finally hitting this. Hit, hit, you know, hitting people up. So that's also compelling because people are like, oh, new, new. I want to see, nobody's seen this before. So I like that word new uh, when it comes to uh, uh, being a new, you know, a new writer, uh, a writer that uh, hasn't uh, met anyone yet, doesn't have the connections. I think that can be quite compelling. Mm -hmm. You keep mentioning too, you, you don't recommend giving away the ending. And I get, this is a question that I get quite often. And my response actually speaks to something that you're speaking to is when someone asks me that, well, should I give away the ending in the query? My response is, if it's going to, because the point of it is to get them to request the script. So if giving away the ending is going to help you get them to request the script, that's the answer. It's not, there's not a don't give it away or give it away. It's all about trying to get that script request. Correct. Yeah, I guess I just I just find that if you can if you can um, have them wanting to know who done it, you know, by mm -hmm. the end of the query, that maybe there's a better shot. Now maybe there are some some films um, that you want to know, you want would want to know how it ends. You know, I mean, there are some films where we know how it ends. You know, that are based on uh, real life experiences. You know, that people mm -hmm. have had. So you know, maybe in those cases, it gives the person an idea of what it is. They're getting themselves into, for example, with a biography. You know, biography film uh, scripts are very hard to write because you you can't, you don't want to tell the whole story of someone's life. That's too difficult. You, you have two hours in which to tell a part of someone's life, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe in a situation like that, it, it would be beneficial. And I'm sure um, because you're saying sometimes it has benefited folks that um, there are other instances that I haven't thought of. And I, you know, we come on, obviously I'm, I'm, you know, selling services to screenwriters, you're selling services to screeners. Are there some of these other services, not yours and not mine that you would recommend to writers? Like, are there some other things that you think writers should be doing in addition to our services? I think that uh, submitting to, fil to uh, uh, script competitions is, is a really good idea um, hmm. because you, some of these competitions even offer other services, you know, um, you know, and if you, you know, like a coverage or a rating or something like that. Or, you know, in the least, sometimes it offers a connection. You might get a letter back from someone, you know, hey, we really liked it and it made the quarters, but I'm sorry, it didn't meet, reach the semis. But I think it, that is like a really good idea um, to pick, um, I don't know, maybe 10 to 20. You know, I think a writer should start out the year with a budget and realize that it is going to cost some money to market yourself. And I definitely would put virtual pitch this, in there because you are automatically going to get a connection with someone, you know, mm -hmm. and you can pick and choose who it is that you want to send, you know, pitch a script to. I would also recommend screen comps. Now there's also the blacklist, which is out there. Um, what the blacklist did was they improved ink tips model. You know, ink tip had this um, website and I think they still do where you, you know, post a script um, and then you hope an industry professional peruses through the database and maybe request it. And then Blacklist came along and said, you can do that, plus we'll give you a rating. But I have um, heard some concerns from writers that the ratings aren't consistent. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it maybe that should be part of uh, someone's budget. I think that, you know, finding one of those, you know, other spots, you know, if they, if they like, um, and, uh, you know, 
again, allocating some money also for good script coaches, you know what I mean? To make sure that, you know, if you're getting some rejections, maybe you need to relook at it and rewrite, um, you know, so, you know, it's like figure out what your budget is at the beginning of the year and try to allocate money towards each, you know, especially emphasizing, you know, the, the website that you like best or the couple websites you like best. And I don't know. What do you think, Ashley? 10 yeah. to 20 competitions? I mean, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Is, is sometimes writers, they feel a little too skeptical and, you know, they feel like they're a little too tight because at the end of the day, um, you don't want to spend money that you need for food and rent, but you do want to spend money, just like spending money on an education or any of these other things, find the things that work for you. The other thing I recommend, and I can say this with my own career, you never know what's going to work for you. And so trying a variety of services is probably the first stop. Don't spend a ton of money on any one service. Try a bunch of them and see which one seems to resonate with you. You like the most. It just feels like a, you know, a good connection. I agree. You know, um, what, where we like to differentiate ourselves is with that access, the guaranteed access. Mm -hmm. And that's what, why we feel people have been compelled year after year to, to continue using virtual pitch desk because we have this, you know, 500 pros on there. You can pick and choose who you, who you want to pitch and that's going to be based on what they've produced and what they say they're looking for. You send them a pitch and within five days, you must get a response of yes, send me the script or no thanks. And they have to give an explanation as to why they're passing. And, and that's through like boxes that are that they can check off. Mm -hmm. um, and so that access itself, even it is a win for the writer because most of the time, if you have a good story and even if it's not right for that a production company, they will sometimes say, hey, stay in touch. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is a this is a really good story, but we have something similar. We'd like to see another one or I know someone else that likes it. So you're getting yourself connected just by doing those the pitching. Mm -hmm. I think that that's less so when you post your script on a website and you hope someone will look at it. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're not immediately getting connected. Um, and uh, I think script competitions is also sort of like an immediate connect because they have to read it, right? They're having to read it. It's mm -hmm. like, unlike a couple of the sites I've mentioned, you know, maybe they'll, maybe they'll peruse it. Maybe they won't. But if somebody sends a script to like six figure competition, it's going to get read and it's going to get read by some pretty uh, experienced, um, talented uh, professionals, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're you're getting that connection, and I think that connection is what's important. You have to get yourself out there, like we were talking about earlier in terms of producing. Yeah, I produced a couple of short films, and then boom, I was off to the races with features. Now I could have never predicted that, you know, but you know what I have learned in in my years, if I've learned nothing else, is I'm it's much easier and I'm much more likely to meet people if I'm not in my apartment. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so. so. Yeah, I'm yeah. curious too. Um, one thing I recommended, this was years ago. I did one of these where you pitch to a producer, but it was through, I think at that point, Skype, but there's mm -hmm. an actual producer. And it's basically what you're talking about this LA. And one of the things that occurred to me, and I've recommended this to writers, and I think it could kind of work. It would be the same recommendation for your service is, you know, it's all about networking and making these act, like real connections. And I think if somebody pitched over and over again to the same people, they would start to remember that person and if they like their material even as you say and i don't think writers especially when they're getting in they fully like they think there's this very binary thing is the script is either good or it's bad and if it's good it's going to get produced and it just doesn't work like that and you know by pushing these by by continuously like if they come up with a strategy and they find five or ten producers on your site and then over the course of the next two years they always are pitching them they're always sending them those producers will start to remember them and they might resonate and then eventually Oh, you know, I didn't really like that other pitch, but the writer seemed cool. And then they get the next pitch and say, you know what, I'll give this writer a chance because they've started to build up that rapport. Um, and yes. it could definitely work what you're talking about. But even face to face, I think getting to is a way of getting to know people in a real way. I No, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that you're absolutely right about that. So, well, perfect, perfect. So how can people find VPF? Maybe you can kind of give us the link there. Um, so they would go to virtualpitchfest.com. And um, you can register for free and okay. 
kind of check the site out. And then um, our we have a starting price is $55 for five pitches. Um, we have a 10 pitch package, which is 95. And then we have a 25 pitch package, which is um, 195. However, we run deals all the time. Um, we run those through Facebook and Twitter. And so uh, if you're looking, and sometimes we just post it on the website, you know, hey, we're mm -hmm. running a deal. So, um, so the, pit, the per pitch price is even lower than what might, it might seem to be uh, for a lot of the time. Gotcha, gotcha. Is there anything you've seen recently? I just like to wrap up the interview by asking the guest, is there anything you've seen recently, HBO, Netflix, Hulu, that you thought was really great and maybe a screenwriting audience to check it out? Well, there's so many good series. Or mm -hmm. I like the, the limited series, you know, because there, to me, it's almost like a movie. It's like, you know, you, it's like an eight, 10 hour movie. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And if you like it, you get hooked and you get to binge. And so any like Narcos, I love, for example, um, I, I think Narcos is one of the best, uh, you know, limited series that they've put out and there's mm -hmm. several seasons of them. Um, recently there was, um, a film, I'm sorry, limited series. And it was about, um, a gal who, uh, she was, um, it was a murder thing. And it was like in a, in, I think it was in a Mormon community. I'm forgetting the name of it, but mm. um, that was quite enjoyable for me. Um, let me think about some of the movies. Um, Cause I watch movies, you know, all the time. Um, you know, first of all, as a member of the producers, producers field, I get invited to screenings and then I'm always looking on Amazon uh, you know, to watch new, new movies. I think mm. that the house, the house of Gucci was something that, hmm. um, I liked. I know that it didn't have a wonderful ending. A lot of people didn't think, but, um, I just, I, I did, I did like that film quite a bit. Um, and I liked, um, licorice pizza to a degree. I thought the writing was, hmm. was, was interesting, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, kind of captured um, some of the essence of the 1970s in a, hmm. in a, in a good way. Um, so those films come to mind. I think there's okay, yeah. more. I mean, there's yeah, yeah. one. No, those I, are, yeah. yeah, those are great recommendations. Yeah, yeah it's an exhaustive list. But yeah, that's, those are some great ones that, um, that people can check out. What's the best yeah. way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I will round up for the show notes. Sure. Um, well, once they... Um, register for free you know on virtual pitch fest they'll be able they'll be on our mailing list Perfect. and so we at times will promote other companies like six figure uh script competition um sometimes stuff going on at coverfly and screencraft so we will promote um other folks sometimes and so it keeps people you know in the loop a little bit i think our writers like that um and also to maybe join uh, facebook or twitter because we um, not only sometimes post stories that are relevant that are in the news regarding screenwriting and filmmaking, but we post uh, when new pros sign up, which happens on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And we also post um, the winners of our monthly hot list contest. And uh, we post um, deals uh, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. We don't post the deals on Twitter, but we post them on Facebook. Okay, perfect. Well, as I said, I'll round all that stuff up for the show notes. Well, David, I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with me today. Lots of great information and, and hopefully some people will check out your site. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate it. You know, I hope they do. And, um, you know, if anybody has any questions, they can reach out to me at info at virtualpitchfest.com. You know, if, if they uh, if they ended up um, uh, coming to me through this uh, podcast, you know, I'll send them a free pitch so they can try it out if they like. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. Out. Very nice. You're going to doubt. Yeah. Just, I'm sure you'll get yeah. a couple of people. Just, add, just mention Ashley Myers, send me an email or, you okay. know, and, and, and we take it from there. So perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Very generous. Thank I you. I can Thank extend you. that for, let's say a couple of weeks, you know, uh, perfect from, from uh, the date that you post the video. SYS is from concept to completion screenwriting course is now available. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash screenwriting course. It will take you through every part of writing a screenplay, coming up with a concept, outlining, writing the opening pages, the first act, second act, third act, and then rewriting. And then there's even a module at the end on marketing your screenplay once it's polished and ready to be sent out. 
We're offering this course in two different versions. The first version, you get the course, plus you get three analyses from an SYS reader. You'll get one analysis on your outline, and then you'll get two analyses on your first draft of your screenplay. This is just our introductory price. You're getting three full analyses, which is actually the same price as our three pack analysis bundle. So you're essentially getting the course for free when you buy the three analyses that come with it. And to be clear, you're getting our full analysis with this package. The other version doesn't have the analysis. So you'll have to find some friends or colleagues who will do the feedback portion of the course with you. I'm letting SYS select members do this version of the course for free. So if you're a member of SYS Select, you already have access to it. You also might consider that as an option. If you join SYS Select, you will get the course as part of that membership too. A big piece of this course is accountability. Once you start the course, you'll get an email every Sunday with that week's assignment. And if you don't complete it, we'll follow up with another reminder the next week. It's easy to pause the course if you need to take some time off, but as long as you're enrolled, you'll continue to get reminders for each section until it's completed. The objective of the course is to get you through it in six months so that you have a completed polished screenplay ready to be sent out. So if you have an idea for a screenplay and you're having a hard time getting it done, this course might be exactly what you need. If this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash screenwriting course. It's all one word, all lowercase. I will, of course, link to the course in the show notes, and I will put a link to the course on the homepage up in the right-hand sidebar. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing producer Kim Adelman. She's written a book about producing shorts and how they can help a young filmmaker's career. If you listen to this podcast often, you'll know that I'm a big proponent of short films. I think it's a great way for writers to get some credits, especially early in their careers. So we have a great talk next week on short films, how to write them, how to get them produced, and what you can do with them and how they can help your career. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's our show. Thank you for listening.